Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Happy to welcome back a familiar face, at least for me, but should be for some of you as well. Matt Hill. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. How are you doing? Doing absolutely wonderful. Excited to see you back here again. I know it's been a little while. We talked about it before, but we're gonna we're gonna be seeing more of you. I know that. And that's exciting for me. If nobody else, just know I'm I'm sitting here and I'm rooting for you, Matt. So <laughs> Thanks for joining us again. Matt is going to be talking about mastering artful color at dusk with custom camera profiles. So I want to give a huge thanks to our sponsors over at Calibrate. So thank you very much to them for going ahead and getting this set up. I've seen a little sneak peek of the, the event today. So I'm super excited and you should be too, because there's some real gems in here, stuff that we've talked about uh, in the past that we haven't really dived into that I know Matt's going to dive into. So I'm not going to take up any more of his time because I know he's got a lot to cover, but I will just let everybody know if you do have any questions that you want to get over to Matt regarding any of this information, please feel free to do so. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. Otherwise, on Vimeo and Facebook, you can use the comment section. Matt, thanks for being here. I'll join you back in a little bit. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, today, we're going to talk about one of those things that people really don't like talking about, which is color management. Um, I'm going to kick it off uh, by starting with the deck, but first things first, I'm a guy that is known for night photography, uh, and we're going to talk about why I'm talking about dusk during this presentation, uh, because it's, it's integral to a lot of the things that I do, and I'm sure that a lot of you like shooting at dusk and twilight also. So let's get right into it. Let me share my screen here, make sure we got this correct desktop going. And we get the deck going here. All right. Uh, so uh, this is, of course, our title slide. And I also want to thank Calibrite for sponsoring, sponsoring this. Calibrite uh, is really the best at color right now. Uh, I've trusted them and the technology behind them, which formerly was X-Rite, uh, for a long, long time. So uh, I've been involved with and using color management for, gosh, 20, 25 years. Uh, and to me, it's like breathing. So also, I really am interested. My name is Matt. I'm, I'm interested in good color. Um, and I'll just very short story here. Um, the, I was really fascinated with black and white for a long time. Uh, and what happened was that one, one year it was about three, four years ago, four years now, I told myself, this is the year that I'm going to really, really, really completely understand color inside and out so i put aside shooting black and white for that whole year and the result of that um, was that i became very intimate with color and color temperature and hues and uh, i'm going to share some of those insights with you as we go along here but perhaps uh, if you've run into issues with color the results of this presentation will help you uh, and if uh, perhaps you'll also be inspired uh, to to come back and revisit some other images. So uh, the I am part of a group called National Parks at Night. We specialize in teaching night photography in national parks and photo tours around the world. So let's just talk about this. I am uh, I'm a I'm a lifelong student of light, uh, but I am not a sunset photographer. You'll be seeing some pictures here that happen during or close to after sunset. But I don't go out to shoot sunset. It's the beginning of me staying out for three, four, six, seven hours because I shoot deep into the night. Uh, so I get to see the sun go down a lot. Uh, and I get to see what the angle and the quality of light is. Um, and to me, it's just it's it's an essential part of understanding that and being a student of light. I love light and I'm never going to stop studying it. But you got to admit, sunsets and twilight are unarguably gorgeous times of day to make photographs. Uh, this is in the northern Mojave Desert. And after the sun is down, the quality of the light changes. And it just, it has an older, an otherworldly feel. It has a beautiful palette to it. There are lots of reasons the night photographers often begin shooting at sunset. It starts with a quality of light. Um, 
it, it will also include what the colors are that happened during that time. And specifically, the amount of detail in the shadows. If we look at this picture from Tunnel View in Yosemite, the detail in the trees is something that you probably could not get on a night without moon. However, the moon without clouds would be very directional and cause sharp shadows and deep shadows in the trees. This is twilight light that's in the foreground and it is almost omnidirectional. Therefore, the contrast is low, but the detail is quite high because of that. And that's one of the main reasons that night photographers will start shooting during twilight to get a base exposure. And then they can keep the camera in the same place and later on shoot something with stars and composite those two together to create one final image. When the direct light of the sun disappears below the horizon, it's replaced by either reflected and or diffused light. This is light that's coming at an angle from beyond the horizon, below zero degrees. So we'll talk more about that. It creates a softer contrast and definitely a different color palette. And as you shoot more twilight, you become more attuned to the nuances that twilight provides. This also happens just before sunrise, you know, and just in reverse. Um, this photograph is at Mono Lake. It's facing east directly towards where the sun will rise, but it was expressly done so we could capture the zodiacal light, uh, which happens in the fall before sunrise in the spring, just after sunset, uh, about an hour after sunset. So what you can see here, that color on the horizon is that first kiss of sunrise, just about to happen, but we still have full starry sky. This is a single exposure. And uh, with good planning, you can use the different colors of post-sunset or pre-dawn uh, to your advantage. When you work on astro landscape photography for a long time, you begin to desire greater quality. And one way to achieve this is by capturing your landscape during dusk and your stars at the end or after twilight. You'll hear this more than once during this presentation. These two images are often blended, although they may look dramatically different when you photograph them. We'll come back to this example and explore it in greater depth in light one. One other reason you might start shooting during twilight is capturing the gentle alpine glow, which is this beautiful light that's reflected off of the atmosphere and then to the tops of mountains. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous light that it, you should desire because it's just it's beautiful and it comes with this other palette of light that only happens during twilight. Uh, capturing the gradients that occur in the sky during dusk is another goal. Uh, this I punched in with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and positioned myself so I could put that crescent moon right at the end of that tree. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I still like the picture. Um, and you can also Focus on capturing earthshine. Uh, earthshine is what when you see light reflecting off of the earth back onto the darker side of the moon. This is a crescent moon, but the crescent part is overexposed, and we can see the shadowy part of it uh, because of light bouncing off of the earth. And it's just uh, that's another special moment there. And in the foreground, you should see that there's two different landforms. There's one darker in the foreground, one that's a little bit more pale, uh, receding towards where the moon is there. Uh, capturing supermoons rising during sunset or twilight is also a tricky proposition, but it is a very popular proposition to throw a long lens on, grab your photo pills, figure out where it's going to rise, and then grab it because it moves pretty fast. So you have to use a, a really high shutter speed. And the reason you do this the day before the full moon is usually the sun is still in the sky at the same time, so it lights up the landscape. Urban landscapes, many of you living in New York will recognize this scene from Bloomberg Park. Uh, urban landscapes have massive opportunity and appeal. 
they also have high contrast. And they also have highlights that are easy to lose and underlit clouds, light that comes from under the clouds and gives it another color cast. So all of this happens once the sun is below the horizon. The palette changes. And this is a panorama. It's probably nine, 10 panels wide uh, and longer exposures, but single exposure for each frame vertical. And when blend, blended together and processed, we could see this a little bit more later, it turns into this um, I don't know, glowy yet crisp image. And we're going to explore this also. All stages of dusk are beautiful. And each stage of twilight, dusk, I'm using them interchangeably here, uh, have their own qualities. You can see different things during each of these stages. For me, good capture leads to good edits. You've heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? It all starts in the field. You need to make sure that you cover the basics while you're in the field. So the first thing you want is a histogram that doesn't clip. In night photography, primarily the shadows. If there are highlights that are absolutely essential in your scene, you have to make sure you don't clip your highlights. If that one photograph doesn't contain all of the elements that you want, you might have to leave your camera in place and shoot at multiple different times to composite. Like you might shoot at seven o'clock and nine o'clock and put those two together. Also, you really need to be precise with color. And this I hinted at in the beginning, that starts with choosing your color temperature on the camera instead of letting the camera decide it. Uh, and it will continue into other things that we'll talk about. Also, being intentional, looking at a scene and through the practice of doing this over and over, you can start to develop this and say, I want the viewer to see this first. I want the viewer to see this second, and therefore you will compose and light and focus on things in order to draw people's attention to certain places. While you're in the field, slow down, pump the brakes, think about it and be intentional. When it comes to editing, post-processing, I prefer natural looking edits. There's all sorts of opinions about what beautiful is and they're all valid. It's your art. Right? There's, there's a lot of opinions out there and feel free to listen to whomever you like or multiple people and say, this is the right way. But I'm not saying this is dogmatic. I'm saying this is what works for me. I prefer natural. I have reasonable saturation, not oversaturated. Good contrast, which is really hard in night photography to make sure you have enough contrast throughout the entire dynamic range. True blacks. This is often overlooked by people in post-processing they don't find, they don't make sure that some of this looks like it's actually nighttime. Some real blacks, they leave it a little bit gray. And then believable detail in the shadows. And what does that mean? Well, it's easy to raise up because these cameras are so fantastic these days. It's easy to raise up the value, the brightness of your image so much that you can see everything. However, it doesn't look like a nighttime photograph anymore. So you put all these things together and that's what I call a natural looking edit. And most of the guys, in fact, all the guys uh, that work at National Parks at Night, we all believe basically the same thing, which is we heavily lean towards natural post-processing rather than fantastic. Not rejecting it, it's just our preference. Now let's move on to one of my favorite topics, which is what color is twilight? Uh, buckle up, this part is fun. I just made this for you guys. I was so excited to talk about color that I wanted to step into talking about the different stages of what twilight is. Now, let me explain this graph for a second. What you see is the sun, <laughs> it doesn't go around the earth. Um, the earth goes around the sun, but it rises in the east and it comes across our sky and then it sets in the west, right? At least here, everywhere. So um, on the right, you can see if you're coming up from night into daytime, you'll see that there's stages of twilight. And then you come around to the left and then there's stages of sunset into twilight down there. We'll start on the left side there. Uh, in fact, let's zoom in a little bit. The black line that's going across the center here 
is the horizon. It's zero degrees. And once the sun gets below that, between zero and six degrees is what's called civil twilight. Um, these technical definitions that we're talking about here, they center around the angle of the sun in relation to the mathematical horizon. Now, this may vary regarding if you have landforms near you, like mountains, like that directly block, block the sun. But I'm talking about the true horizon here, not, not something that could be blocking it, right? So once it goes below the true horizon, the quantity and the quality of light in the sky or the atmosphere change rapidly. This affects how much detail you can extract from the landscape and the color of the light. So going back to it, civil twilight is between zero and six degrees. Nautical twilight is between six and 12. Astronomical is between 12 and 18 degrees below the horizon. And once you're below 18 degrees, it's just nighttime, right? And there are no changes until you hit the other side of the cycle uh, coming around to the next morning. Now there's other things that happen during the mathematical descriptions of twilight that photographers have. We call these two things golden hour and blue hour. And let's just start off by saying they're misnomers, right? Um, the misnomer is this, that neither of them are an hour. <laughs> so it can depend on the season and where you are. Uh, and I have an example that I'm going to show you uh, shortly after this, where we can talk about specific times. But if you look at this, golden hour is from when the sun is six degrees above the horizon all the way to four degrees below the horizon. That's when those rich, orangey, reddish, yellow colors come out because of the low angle of the sun and it's passing through all the particulates and the layers of the atmosphere. And that affects the color of the light and the low angle creates strong shadows or it might be diffused through clouds or smoke like places I've been shooting lately. Um, that golden hour is a magical time just before to just after sunset. And then blue hour happens at the end of, you see over here, civil twilight, zero to six degrees. Blue hour is the last two degrees of sun's travel through civil twilight. So blue hour is that other magical time where beautiful things happen. And we'll get more into that detail, but I wanted to establish the definitions here so you guys could see this is what happens every day. Uh, the sun goes through this, uh, it, appeared, it comes around in our sky and it changes in quality and nature every time we go through this. So let's look at uh, when I was in Mojave earlier this year. On March 21st, 2022, golden hour was from 621 to 720 p.m. It's not an hour, it's a minute less, right? So that's, let's call that factual, right? It was an hour on that day. Sunset was during this golden hour. It was at 6.55 p.m. And that's exactly when civil twilight started, 6.55 until 7.20 p.m. Blue hour was at the end of civil twilight. It was only 10 minutes long. It's very short, 7.10 to 7.20. And if you want that blue hour shot, you got to nail it then. So nautical twilight begins right after that, 7.20 to 7.50. Uh, so 50 minutes, 20, that's 30 minutes long, right? And then astronomical twilight is at the tail end of that from 7.50 to 8.19. And then you have full nighttime all the way until 5.19 a.m. the next day. So let's look at the colors, right? Uh, we'll do that one next. All of these following photos that I'm going to show you, they're post-processed exactly the same way. Why did I do that? And I want to pause for a second and talk about that. Different people shoot different ways, right? There's so many ways to approach solving the problem, how to get an image. I'm going to suggest to you very strongly that you should do the same thing. I will talk about it again at the end. Shoot everything at daylight. And that way you'll have a consistent recording of it. And I process them all the same way too. Daylight, 5600K. The color profile that I chose is custom. And we'll get back to that. The other things that I did and nothing else except for what you see here was lens corrections. I removed chromatic aberration and lens profile corrections. So that's what I did in post processing. Here's the first one. This is daylight. This is golden hour. 
and great, right? There's a non-directional light. There's no strong shadows. The sky is bright. The land has enough light on it. And then if we fast forward, only five minutes. Now we're into civil twilight, golden hour. And I'm just going to flip between the two so you can see what changes so quickly. You see how the contrast sort of changes there? There's color in the sky as the angle of the light is now, instead of coming from above the clouds and through them from the side, from underneath now. And it's passing through a whole bunch of things. And then we go further into civil twilight, still in golden hour. Now the light's coming through an even more oblique angle to hit underneath the clouds. And then a little bit more, and then it's starting to drift away. So 703, the 706, that's three minutes. 713, where'd the color go? Huh, well, we've left golden hour and we've gone into blue hour. So this is that magic, magic time where there's really balanced contrast levels. And I'm going to say the so-called blue hour again, it's only 10 minutes long, but the sky and the foreground are about the same value. And this is the, why people love shooting blue hour because you can get it all in one shot. And this is another one. This is only, this is 719, 713, six minutes later, about the same, right? But there's a little bit of color coming back in and then we'll go forward to nautical twilight, the next change. There were no stars during civil. Once we get into nautical, stars start showing up. So now you have stars in the sky and your foreground's getting a little dark. So I added a light here. Uh, my light of choice is the Luxley Fiddle. So it's a little Luxley Fiddle on the left, splashing over to the right. Um, I was setting it up for later on when I was gonna do star trails. Uh, so it's at a different color temperature. It might look a little yellow and a little green to you because I'm set to daylight right now. And we'll come back to that. So I added that low level lighting. And then I went from star points to star trails. So I dropped my ISO and I took a much longer picture. So now we have, again, it's a little bit more balanced. The sky is pretty bright. We're still in nautical twilight, but there's both color and value to the sky and stars at the same time. So nautical twilight has that really special something about it where you can get all that stuff in one place. Then you move forward to astronomical twilight. Now the difference between this and that, you see the foreground gets really dark and also the sky gets really dark, but the sky still has color in it. You might ask, what is that color in the bottom right hand corner? That bottom right-hand corner is light from Los Angeles, which is over 200 miles away. That's called light pollution. Ignore that. That's Los Angeles lighting up the bottom of the clouds from 200 miles away. Look more in the center of the screen here. And you'll see that Astro Twilight has a darker, more yellow, I'm sorry, blue-purple to the sky value. And you can take your star trails, and then you move over into night at 8.20 instead of 7.55. And as soon as you tick over to night, this is true night. Your exposure is not going to change here. But look at the foreground. There's absolutely no detail in the foreground except for where I added lights. There's also probably me walking through there with a flashlight. I was taking another picture over off to the left, and I knew I wasn't going to use these foregrounds. So we'll flip through it again real quick, right? We've got golden hour. Civil twilight, civil twilight, civil twilight, civil twilight, civil twilight, nautical twilight, stars appear. Nautical twilight, star trails, astronomical twilight. And you see how the foreground gets significantly darker and even less light when you get to full night. Now you might also say, Matt, that sky looks like garbage. Yeah, guess what? This is the true color of night. If you think about it, if you keep your camera on the same settings all the time, you're going to see the true color of something. But we have something special. We have the ability to create art. We're not scientists. We don't have to re record this and say, this is the facts as we're presenting it. We're going to say, this is what I believe to be artful. This is my truth, not complete truth. So I would post-process these guys differently, but this is what they actually look like. This is the real color. So... 
the capture settings for this on the camera, and now that we're talking about that, uh, manual white balance was 5600K. And let's talk about camera profiles for a second. Camera profiles are, let's call them recipes, right? It's, it's a way for the camera manufacturer to say, I'm going to present something to you that doesn't look flat, that doesn't look uninteresting, it has some pizzazz, it has some contrast, it has some juiciness and saturation. Those camera profiles can fool you into thinking that um, your photographs are something that they're not. So my strong recommendation is to shoot at neutral or flat all the time so that you see what's actually going on instead of a recipe applied to the, uh, the raw data. Um, and then later on, you can put your fingerprint on it. And then make sure your exposure doesn't clip. I said this before, but now I'm gonna explain it to you. This is a, a screenshot from Lightroom, but your camera can display a histogram too. It might not look like this, but the most important thing is if you look at the left side, that's where the shadows are. The data doesn't hit that left wall. I increase the exposure until the data didn't hit the left wall. That's clipping. When the data hits the left wall, you lose information. On the right-hand side, we care a little bit less about that in night photography. Um, but if you were able to, and I did with this photograph, there was no clipping in the highlights either. So all of the information was inside the goalposts, if you will. And the dynamic range was smaller than what the camera was capable of. So I got all of the data. Now let's talk about some twilight capture settings. Um, you can always adjust your white balance and raw post-processing, right? Here's what I really wanna say. If you take your camera out of auto white balance, you gain control and consistency. The, applying those in-camera profiles might make you feel good on the scene, but they may also trick you into believing the scene was more saturated or contrasty. We talked about this before, but I need to reiterate. Your goal should be to capture accurate image data that gives you the best chance to finish the image exactly how you want it. And that's why we're here talking today. So now we come to the crux. You should have a color checker with you. In this case, this is a color checker uh, passport. This one folds up like a clamshell, so it protects it. Uh, and then you can also set it out. But basically, you should just shoot it. Take it out at the beginning, take a photograph, put it away. That's really all you need. When you take that photograph, make sure it's done well. And we'll talk about that in a second. But if you forgot to shoot it, there's also a way around that. And uh, But you should just take a shot of it and move on. Um, when you do take a shoot, shot of it, make sure it's evenly illuminated not half in the light, not half out. Um, you want to expose it without clipping. We just talked about that. Make sure it's within the boundaries of your dynamic range, good exposure. Don't touch the panels. Don't put your fingers on them. They are uh, painstakingly crafted to be exactly what they are. And if you touch it, you're going to alter it and you're going to alter the science behind it when you try to process it. Fill up the frame of your, your camera as much as you can. It's got to be in focus and shoot at relatively level. It used to matter more. Now it matters less. The processing is uh, very, very, very easy. So this, this is great. This one, this one that I had here, not so great, right? This one, this is okay. You might be able to make a profile from this, but that's better. So just fill up your, your screen a little bit like that. Um, you can also hold it out. This is perfect. Hold it out in front of you. Uh, again, don't touch the squares and don't obscure the panels. Uh, you can also have somebody else hold it. But if you give it to somebody else, tell them don't touch it. Right. Uh, this was shot in my gallery. My gallery has overhead track lighting. The LEDs are great for art on the walls. However, it needs profiling. So when you shoot something in there, I throw up the color checker to make sure that the art and the humans look good. This worked also. You know, this photograph here, right here, had enough of the color checker in it to make a profile. So now we're going to pop out of this, but I'll walk through what I'm going to talk to you about. We're going to go into Adobe Lightroom Classic, uh, and we're going to, I'm going to show you some before or after raw and edited photos. I'm going to show you how to export and use a camera profile shot with a color checker. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to white balance, you know, with or without a color checker in the scene. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to apply your signature look after you've done these very basic things. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, all right, so this, oh, I, I surprised you. This is a horse. 
this is not a, a landscape but this happened when i was on a night photography workshop out in north dakota at theodore roosevelt national park so here is what it looked like out of camera right now and here's what it looked like after i applied the basic color management and an edit and it'll be the same for the following images well this horse found another horse and they made friends and you know this is what it looked like out of camera very basic right and then with a little bit of character added a little bit of my fingerprint uh, this is what it, it came out of camera and this is what it looked like when i was done with it some things are subtle and in all cases i call this finishing the photographs when the way they come out of camera uh they're not done yet so a little bit of post-processing is really taking care to finish your photographs uh, there we go this is what this pano the stitched panorama looked like before i finished finished it and that's what happened when i decided that i was done with it now i look at it now and this happens over and over by the way folks and i say that sky might be a tad juicy and I, by juicy, I mean it's slightly saturated. So I might just, uh, the vibrance is already down three. I think I'm just gonna pull the saturation down a couple of points while we're here because it makes me feel better, right? So that's where it started and that's where it ended. And that feels more authentic to me. Uh, here we go. This is what it looked like out of camera. And this is how it made me feel. Now, none of these things are manufactured. Those colors were there. The camera just captures such a wide amount of data that what I did was I pushed everything into the right place. And part of that was using color management the right way. A couple more shots from the islands. This is before and after. See the differences there. The before and the after. And that one I think was very striking the before the after there we go there's the before there's the after and this one obviously is during twilight there's uh if you guys can figure out which part of twilight it is and you're good students let me know in the chat and this one also during twilight this is the before and there's the after and this one is right near where i live this is shot through a telescope really low contrast and also in crop sensor mode but this is the after and it looks better before and after this one's striking this is the before yet modern cameras have enough information but that's the after it was there i knew it because i saw it in the histogram all right so so that right there was just a bunch of images i wanted to show you and now let's talk about what it takes to do this. So you, you have a color checker and you photographed it. All you need to do in Lightroom after installing the software, which is free and available on the Calibrite.com website, is while you have it here, you click export and you go to color checker camera calibration and you give it a name. I'm just going to say name, but name is not right. Here's where you want to stop and say, what was this? where I usually do it this way. I say I was at Mono Lake and this was the Nikon Z62. So I'm gonna say Z62 and I'm gonna say dusk. And that will tell me where I was, which camera it was and what stage of the day it was. So that when I go select this, I have it. And if I click export, now it's going to run in the background and you'll see that this is running back here you can go do other things in lightroom no big deal when it's done it's going to prompt you to restart lightroom i've already processed all my profiles i use them all the time right so here's one right here i'm going to flip it back to adobe color which is how most people's stuff comes in right and now watch these panels in here in fact let's zoom in and i'm going to flip back and forth between them okay so Right now, this says this profile has been generated successfully, restarted to activate. I don't need to do it because I already have one. I already processed one from this, but I'm going to show you. So watch those panels. I go to color here. You see the huge shift in colors that happens there? 
this is what a camera profile does. It takes these known values, which were slightly different than they should have been, and it pops them right back into place. That's step one. And it's a really important step because it takes you from an area of being close to the truth to the truth. You're in the, the closest place to having colors accurately represented, which means when you start making edits, now you're starting from a place of neutrality. And every make, change you make is from an origin, uh, an unknown place, instead of a place that might be slightly off to the left or four feet from where it should be, right? So once you have that, and this profile is located up here, normally if you click browse here, you'll see that the favorites are all there. They sometimes fill those in with all of the Adobe recipes, which are Adobe Color, Monochrome, Landscape, Neutral, Portrait, Standard, Vivid. These are also recipes. They're what Adobe thinks based on all of their experience, which is a lot. Uh, it could be, you might be good things, but it's not based on calibration. What we're doing now is avoiding these camera matching ones, which come from my Nikon camera, right? And we're going down to profiles here. And here's all the profiles that I've made for this camera. And it's only gonna list the ones, if you have two different cameras, like I do, a Nikon Z6 and a Z6 II, you're gonna see different profiles based on the camera that you have. So I've chosen this. And now if I wanted to, I could also go to this panel right here by grabbing the eyedropper and say, I want that to be my white balance. So let's zoom back out and we'll say, this is what it was, right? And this is what I did. But why would I wanna do that? Well, let's take a look at a real picture instead, right? Here's a picture that I shot later and I have mono like dusk. Let's see if I had the same color, the same camera. There we go. So I have Astro Daylight. Ah, I have a different camera here. So this is, I just proved my point. So this I shot with a different camera, uh, but I did shoot this other camera uh, and it has its own profiles here, which were listed down here in browse. So I have a dual luminant, which we can talk about, but basically you shoot your, cam your target under two different light sources and it creates a profile that works for practically everything. Uh, so, but this camera is an Astro modified camera. So if I left Adobe color in here, it has this color and I'm not sure if it's close to the truth, but if I go to my Astro Daylight Direct Sun, this is a truthful image right there. And from here, if I wanted to, I could go back to uh, the white balance from the card that I shot it from, select it and copy it and come back to this one and paste it on here. And then I could have that white balance. But take note of this, and I don't know if this will zoom in your screen. Um, the color temperature is 2550. And this is where knowing your color temperature matters. If I type in 5600 here, that doesn't really look normal. Um, most of the night photography that we do after twilight is done, most of us shoot it at 3850. 3850 makes the Milky Way, which is coming through in this direction over here, makes the things that happen in the Milky Way look neutral or some the dust channels. But in this case, I had it down around 2550. And that's because we have over here, we have this zodiacal light. And if I wanted to, I could pop in here and pick something from there. That's less accurate than picking yourself something in the color checker. Let's look at another example here. So this one, I created this, let's start with Adobe Color there. This is Adobe Color, the colors look good, but our eyes adjust so quickly, how would you know? Uh, I'm going to go Olmstead Point, Z62, 3850K, Lux the Fiddle. That one pops up right back into place where it should be. I grab my white balance picker and I go to the second panel here. And now I have white balanced. And now all the group photos that I took after this, everybody's skin color looks fantastic. All the colors are exactly where they need to be. Um, I can also say, and I'll show you the pictures here. These two pictures were shot with the same camera 
just later in the night. You see, this says 1.23 a.m. That says 12.33 a.m. This is 10.57 p.m. I can copy from this one. I can copy and say, you could say check none and say treatment and profile and just your white balance. Or you could say check all if you want to. But I'm going to copy just those things. I'm going to go over here and paste them. And now I took the white balance and the profile from this and I said apply it to later. So this is actually what it looked like. This is the color of it. And I'm going to say, see, this is what I was talking about with the Milky Way. Daylight white balance 5450 is not appropriate for nighttime photography. So I'm going to back off on that. 3850 is appropriate. And you see the Milky Way looks really wonderful there, as do the little nebula that you see in there, right? And we come back here, and we put this one back to where it was. We could just type in here 3850. So now I have neutral versus a night sky. However, what's affecting your judgment here is that there's a forest fire right there on the other side of that dome. So there's yellow, green smoke drifting across this way. But down here in the front where there's less haze, you can see the granite looks relatively neutral. And this is moon set also. So you have the moon coming through all of that atmos atmospheric haze and hitting half dome there and the rest of these mountains. But when you get up to the sky, everything looks crystal clear and perfect and beautiful. And a final demonstration of what you can do. So what happens when you're someplace else and you didn't shoot your color checker before you started shooting? If it's the same camera, you could take something that was shot during the day, which I have here. This is the mono like dusk one instead of the golden color, right? So I can go to this image and say, I don't want it to look like this. I want it to look like this. And now to see how the colors just pop in into the right space and all the colors came into the right place. This is how I remember seeing it. Although our memory can be faulty too. I know it's not wishful thinking. I know I'm not guessing because I used science to get here. And now, now I can start to make creative decisions. And let's see if I did. Oh, look at that, I did. So let's, let's talk about creative decisions. So this is where the profile took us. But if I started making global adjustments here to everything, it affects the entire picture all at once. But to me, this foreground and the sky should be dealt with separately. And there are powerful tools for masking and selection included in Lightroom now. Thank you, Adobe. And if I select the foreground, I can have a different set of corrections for the foreground than I do for the top. So I'll briefly talk through this one. I brought the temperature up, I made it warmer, and I added some magenta. And I would just turn it on and off because it seemed too cyan and too blue to me. So I changed that even though it was truthful and I changed it. And then I brought the contrast down because I didn't want to raise the shadows because there's not enough data there would make it look muddy. So then in the sky, in the sky, I also made it warmer and pulled it over to red. So that I made a creative decision on that one, lower contrast. And we'll pop this on and off to see. And the dehaze, I have to say this over and over, Dehaze, whenever you apply it, it adds, dehaze adds blue every time you use it and contrast uh, and the saturation. So every time you pull the dehaze slider up, be careful. Um, you're probably going to have to back your saturation back down a little bit when you use that. And you're probably going to have to move away from the blues a little bit if you get aggressive with your dehaze because it might look awkward. So, so there is uh, a little bit about how to simply grab a shot of it, create a color profile that takes you to neutral. And then if you want to white balance, you can also white balance and do that. Um, I see that Scott's popping on. He's probably asking me to come in for a landing or somebody have a question.
No, no, no. I'm I'm just I keep going. Okay. I, want, I wanted you to see me. That's all, Matt. Hi, Scott. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about creating your, your signature edit. Um in this case, we already saw this image, right? I know that I'm an Astro Daylight Direct Sun because I have an Astro modified camera, but I use the color checker to rein in the crazy colors when I need to. And I can have those beautiful nebulae colors when I want them. But right now, this picture is not about that. It's about the desire for light. So in this case, I want to go back to zero. The sky was a little bright and the foreground was a little dark, which happens in night photography. So the first thing I did was I created a new mask and I said, select sky. And in this mask, I then started to say, I want more information up top. So I added some dehaze and I added clarity to make the star sharper. There was nothing else needed. The color just became what it should be. And if I wanted to, I could pull the saturation back a little bit, make it a little more pastel-y and, but I really like that orange coming in because that's what it looked like. And then I came over here to duplicate and invert and I created another mask that was just for the foreground. Uh, and from this foreground, I also extracted, I said, don't use uh, the lights, the darkest parts there. I also excluded part of the tufas out there. And then when I was done with selecting what I wanted, all I really did was I actually brought down the texture in the water. I wanted the water a little bit softer. Um, and I also made sure that those blacks became real blacks. And that's something I talked about. And the contrast was too high. So all I did was bring the contrast down. Some people would be tempted to bring the shadows up, which creates muddy images to me. So instead I bring the contrast down. So yes i showed you how i did it um and how do i arrive at these decisions it's through processing and reprocessing uh learning from other people and saying i want this to look that way and understanding what every slider does your signature is you taking the experience that you had in the field and saying i want somebody to feel or observe the things that I saw and come away with feelings or observations like I did. So I'm going to provide this to them. Um, yeah, so uh, there we go. So when you do your color right, you, you, you're going to spend a lot of a lot less time futzing with the color. And you're going to start from a place of confidence, knowing that the colors are what they should be and then making smaller adjustments to get to where you want to go. I guarantee you. Um, like this shot, the skin tones just look perfect despite how hard the situation was to get good looking skin tones. Um, from Astronomical Twilight onwards, I mentioned it before, but here's a great example. We change our camera settings to the white balance of 3850 and we set our lights to the same thing. So we're providing a neutral light source. If there's a moon out, it's slightly different but we're not going to cover that tonight. Um, and this is a wicked realization when it comes. Starlight is also enough sometimes. This entire scene is lit by stars. That's it. There's enough light out there to get enough detail. The cameras can handle it these days to make a, a photograph where you can see by that. And you can also control the color so it doesn't look wrong or muddy. Pop quiz, I want to see what you guys say in uh, the comments. How many people here attending live, if, or if you're watching the replay, have profiled and calibrated the monitor? I really want to know. Uh, and while you guys are answering, I just want to say, if you said no, and I hope this doesn't make you hesitate, uh, it's likely you're not seeing the same colors or the brightness that I presented, that I'm seeing on my screen. And that's because hardware calibration works. Uh, it's taking a known set of values and it's adjusting it through what's called a lookup table, creates a, a profile and setting the, the brightness and contrast on your displays to be something that's neutral, something that's a known point of origin, right? So you should be doing it um, if you're serious about editing, because any decisions you make on an unprofiled calibrated monitor are starting from a place that might not be 
uh, a good place. It might be too contrasty. It might be too dark. It might be too bright. And when you show people pictures, you say, oh, it, it's not supposed to look that way. It's probably because you need to do this. I'm going to blow through these. It's really simple. These are colorimeters. This is the one that I use, the color checker display plus. Um, I have high-end monitors. I have two BenQs on either side of me here, the 27 and the 32 inch. And I have my MacBook Pro in the middle. I use this one device to pro profile and calibrate all three of them. There is a lesser costing one called the color checker display. This plus a, a, a color checker passport or color checker mini, you can get those two things and you're ready to go. It's not a huge investment. You don't have to have this unless you have higher end displays like a BenQ, an Azo, uh, one of the high-end Dells or Sonics like that. You can do use this if you have something that's not up there like Adobe 1998 RGB. Um, and then finally, there's this Color Checker Display Pro. Right now, they have a limited time offer where there's a free Color Checker Mini with it. Um, good stuff. Check it out on the Calibrate website, and the BNH folk can help you understand what the differences are between these. If you're not taking care of your monitors, you should be. And profile once a week, once a month when you see a drift. Second pop quiz How many people? attending or watching, right, have profiled their cameras and lenses. Now that I showed you, how many of you are using color checkers by any manufacturer? I just want to know, are you camera profiling? And if you do, uh, what, have you, what have you experienced with that? Let's talk about that. So if you said no, no surprise, I'm going to say you should be doing it. And I will also say that I was a skeptic for a while, um, I, primarily because in night photography, I didn't really see that there was a huge opportunity for this. I didn't see that it would work, but I tested it a lot and I see the results and you shoot, you get a profile in the daylight or you make a dual luminous profile and you apply that to your night photography and the colors just pop right into place. So if you're doing it at dusk, it's definitely going to help because those colors are just, they're too beautiful to ignore and you need to do that. If you did say yes, Bravo and Bravo. Um, the two ones I'd recommend, the Color Checker Passport Photo 2. It's a clamshell. It's great. It's also got a white and a gray card on it. And then there's the Classic Mini. This is about the size of a credit card. So this is even more portable than the other one. It just doesn't have the clamshell. Um, all in all, please don't be afraid of color management. It's not voodoo. It's not I don't know. It's not somebody trying to make you uh, hurt your brain. It's really not that hard. It can be fun. And I guarantee you'll enjoy your photography more if you do the basic things required for, uh, for color management. So this is a good point to stop and ask questions, but I'm going to leave this on. I am very grateful to BNH. Thank you for hosting this and allowing me to speak about something I'm passionate about. Uh, thank you to Calibrite for making great products and for sponsoring this. And thank you, Scott, for having me. Thank you, Matt, for being here and for putting up with me because <laughs> you know me, you know me quite a long time. So you know that uh, there's, there's a level of required patience. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we did, we did, <laughs> we did get some people. Uh, Buddy said he, uh, he calibrates every month. Uh, Raphael joining us on Vimeo said, uh, excellent webinar, Matt. Um, he does have a calibrated monitor, so he's taking care he of that. So yes. there are people out there responding, letting you know that they are doing the work. So thank you to everybody tuning in. We do have a question here from Elizabeth, which I think is impeccable. I think it's a great question. Wonderful. Not that my opinion counts, but I think I think you're going to enjoy it too. I think I think you're the perfect guy to ask it to. Uh, on the topic of you know editing your photos and yeah. Adobe, whether it be Lightroom or, or if you're using Capture One, whatever whatever editing program you're using, yeah. before these, the the pre era to all of this, how did people pre digital edit their colors? You know what's funny is. Uh, X-ray has had color checkers or gray tag Macbeth before them. There's been color checkers for a long time. So um, I think that 
Oh, geez. As soon as digital happened, those color checkers were used to adjust things digitally. Prior to this, and I can I can throw down some knowledge here, uh, I came up when in college I was running a color photo lab and the proprietor provided us not with a computerized uh, printmaking machine. It was, uh, it was one where you had to do the filtration by hand. So prior to this, you did your color corrections um, uh, using filters and knowing the film stocks. So for going way back, that's how you did it. If you were working with the big dogs, then you had to color match things absolutely exactly you would have to use some calibrated process and that requires hardware and usually software as soon as computers were involved. So there was always a quality insurance and there were always professionals who knew exactly what they were doing and using science to do that. The beautiful part that I'm coming around to today is that those things that used to cost tens of thousands of dollars to participate in, you could get over a hundred, a couple hundred bucks to, to really have that information and that technology and make it accessible to you. I hope that's helpful. That's great. See, I knew I knew you'd be a guy who could answer that question. That's why I, that's why I love having you on here, Matt. I, yeah. I hope I hope that was that was a, an answer that was acceptable. So. Elizabeth, if not, let us know. Yell yeah. at us in the comments. And yeah. Let us know, and I'll I'll yell at Matt off screen. Okay. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Um, Raphael did have a question regarding uh, ND filters and yeah. color checking. So, uh, if you're going to be using, say, a 10 to 15 stop ND filter, uh, which doesn't really let you see anything, how do you go about using something like a color checker to utilize that? <laughs> I love that question. I've never gotten it before, but I have your answer. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is neutral density is a misnomer. There are no truly neutral dense filters. <laughs> so they all have a color tint. So you're asking exactly the right question. Just pop a color checker in front of it. It doesn't have to be at exactly the same time you're shooting. You could take the same duration of photograph, like if it was three minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, or an hour, um, and then process that image with a profile. And then you can then not only profile the colors within that image, but you can white balance it in addition. Um, you don't have to do it at your lowest ISO, although I would recommend it. You could do what we do in night photography. And um, this is how I often get my exposures for ND filters is to shoot it at 6,400 or 12,800. And whatever seconds you have there, you can use exposure equivalency to get down to your lower ISOs. You can also shoot your color checker during that time at when it costs you less seconds to take a picture at a higher ISO. But I would recommend shooting both ISOs to see if there's a color shift because there, most cameras have a dynamic range break. It might be around ISO 800, it depends on the camera, where you get more color gamut at lower ISOs than you do at higher ISOs. So shoot them both is my recommendation, but shoot a color checker. Awesome. And then I wanted to ask you one to finish with. I love hypotheticals. Yeah. <laughs> They're always great questions. So let's live in a hypothetical world here and a, 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 a great world where everybody's got their monitors calibrated. Yes. Gone ahead. Everybody's, everybody's yeah. just a, a calibration, you know, product. Yep. They've got their monitors calibrated. They've got their cameras and lenses calibrated and yep. everybody's living in a calibrated world. When you're going to finish your edit and you're going to, whether it be posted to social media or your end goal is to print, how do you make that decision? Is it a decision that you make for yourself and you say, this is what I'm happy putting out knowing that I'm looking at it? Yeah. Or do you publish based on the viewer who's gonna see the work and what you expect them to enjoy? I think it's more of the latter. Um, finishing is always contextual. If you don't have a context, then it's probably seeing it on your own screen. That would be the first like, I'm gonna spit out a JPEG and I'm gonna look at that JPEG and I'm just gonna smile because I'm done and I enjoyed it, right? But otherwise you're putting it out on the wall as a print, 
you're going to make it more contrasty or juicy for Instagram. You, you have to understand what is around it, the context, what it's going to be juxtaposed with in order to make final decisions about how to finish an image. And if you don't have a goal, then it's probably your goal is your own satisfaction. And I'll be straight, for a long time, that's exactly how I operated. And it made me very happy to say, I'm making this art for myself and it makes me happy. And if that's your gig too, that's fine. Be happy with it. Being happy is a great thing, right? If you're trying to make money, you must honor the person who wants to give you money, right? Uh, either you're an artist or you're in commerce, right? Some people can bridge that gap, but you just sometimes they say, you know what, it's a little bit too blue and you warm it up and you're done, right? So at that point, that's the truth. So <laughs> um, I right now, I don't have um, a lot of those type of commercial relationships. My life is helping other people become better night photographers. So all of the feedback that I give is to help people not be like me, but to be better at what they do, better at making decisions, better at recommending or recognizing the things that they want to improve. And that question is something you ask yourself over and over. And I'll close by saying this, I reprocess images all the time. And I did it prior to this presentation. And I made things that I thought were done before different and done again. So you're never done. Love it. Awesome. Well, Matt, I want to thank you for being here again. If you haven't already gone and checked him out or followed him on any of the social medias that are thrown up here, do it. It's easy. Follow, like, share, whatever it is. It doesn't cost anything. We're supporting each other. That's what we're here to do. So check him out. Uh, huge thanks to you, Matt. Huge thanks to our sponsor over at Calibrite. That's it. That's all the time we have currently for now. But like I said, I know we'll be seeing Matt again super, super soon. Super soon? Super shortly. Soon. Yeah. Shortly. We'll go yeah. with shortly. We're already uh, planning the next one. Yeah. Exactly. So stay on the lookout. Make sure to visit the B&H event space page where we post all of our events. And this way you can pre-register for that one if you enjoyed this one. But that's all the time we have for now. This has been another edition of the B&H virtual event space. We'll catch you next time. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming.